Welcome to the Whole Enchilada, a community of high achievers that fight the status quo, rebel against mediocrity, and make life happen. Let's go. Hey, Enchilada Nation. Uh, really excited to be with you again today. Uh, and I have another uh, really exciting guest and a friend of mine uh, in the conversation, uh, Brandon Ducharme, a wealth advisor. Uh, we were introduced, uh, man, how few months ago, maybe six months ago, you and I got, really started talking. Yeah, yeah, about, yeah, about then. Six, six months. And I will tell you, incredibly sharp guy. You guys are going to love uh, the conversation today. But I will tell you, a lot of you guys know that I do have some skepticism around financial advisors in general, um, because I think most of them don't think the way we think as entrepreneurs. And that is not the case with, with Brandon. I've been overly impressed with his energy, his knowledge, but also coming from a place of like, he is an entrepreneur. He's in our space uh, as far as uh, building wealth, building businesses. And I just love his his uh, mentality and, and and his take on things. So today we're gonna have a wealth building conversation in regards to a, a net worth statement and a cash flow statement. So uh, there's some element of confusion around the two of those. How they inter, inter they're they're two separate things, but they interplay in a really specific way. So we're gonna have that conversation. And if you think you know everything about a net worth statement and a cash flow statement, there's some things that shift and change with that in the economy we're in now that we're gonna talk through today. So stick around. But real quickly, before we jump into that topic, Brandon, give us a little bit of a background on, on who you are personally, professionally, before we jump into this. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marcus. Uh, professionally, uh, a registered investment advisor, uh, carry an insurance license, a real estate license, uh, run business across all three of those major lines while I'm helping people manage their wealth. Um, come from a, a family, it's kind of the family trade. Uh, my grandpa uh, brought himself up after uh, World War II, after growing up in the Great Depression, taught himself how to invest, started developing land, built homes, uh, ended up retiring as the director of housing and urban development in Wisconsin. Taught my dad how to um, save and invest as a kid. I had my dad trading stocks at 11 years old. Uh, my dad built on the family farm. That's where I grew up. So kind of it's it's all passed on down through the generations, if you will. Um, uh, you know, I have a young family uh, and I'm a, and I'm a veteran. Uh, just uh, out here putting uh, hard, hard work to the test and building, building, uh, uh, trying to build a legacy for, for myself and others. Oh, I love that. I, I, I didn't, uh, hear that before about your, your grandpa coming from the great depression. I knew that the generate one generation in front of you was in wealth building. I realized it was two generations deep, but it, it sparked a thought for me when you brought that up that I, I think it's interesting. You see a lot of those people from the era of the great depression. It seems like they're, they, a lot of them, valued money differently because they they went without right it was about making the dollar go a longer way it was interesting to me if is kind of looking at a bunch of different histories some people came out of that from a complete place of scarcity of like i i'm gonna remain frugal and some people came out of that saying i can use though that that the that skill set of being frugal to build uh, wealth that my family and my legacy aren't going to find themselves in this scenario again. Um, but I, I think we find ourselves in a really interesting time right now coming off of really a decade of, of incredible run up in almost any asset class of people are not people not valuing the money the same way because they've really never been without. Um, so I, it's, I think it's an interesting time to have these wealth building conversations because people really haven't had to think about it. They've had had cash flow almost to their fingertips where people need to start thinking differently around their money or else there's going to be a problem. Yeah, it, it's an interesting time. The last, you know, the last 10, 12 years, it feels like no matter what you did, you could have made money, right? It was pretty, <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty hard to lose, you know, and if uh, if you made bad choices, um, the rising tides kind of lifted you up anyways. Um, so it still turned out. Okay. I always, I always like to remind people there's a difference between a bad investment that turned out good and a good investment that just happens to turn out bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And, that's um, true. generally speaking, I'm willing to throw my money at something personally, that's a good investment that just really could turn out bad. Um, cause that's calculated risk yep. versus, you know, a bad investment that just you got lucky and it turned out good, right? I, I really don't want any of those in my portfolio. 
Oh. Um, you, you run that iteration enough and, and we know the law of large numbers tells you you're going you're gonna to lose. So interesting. You bring up luck. I was, I was reading this morning uh, and uh, Marcus Aurelius was talking about good fortune. Uh, and he says, and, and good fortunes are well to, uh, excuse me, and good fortunes are a well-tuned soul, get good impulses and good actions. So it really has nothing to do with luck. It's like, what have you done? To like prep yourself, think through it, making good choices. Yeah. Other people will perceive it as luck, but it really is about like how calculated were you and in, in putting it together. So it's interesting yeah. you bring it up when I was reading that this morning. Um, it was interesting. I've got I had someone approach me in the last couple of weeks around. Uh, it's actually look it could potentially be an incredible investment opportunity for me. Um, and and it always begs the question: Well, if it's that good of a deal, why are you selling it? Right? Yeah interesting to me that the person that that is looking for they want to stay involved in the investment but they need to bring in a capital partner um because they've lost a significant portion of their net worth because they had an all-in-one basket in in a portion of the stock market that that happened to be a, a, a sector that really crashed hard and so yeah. where they thought they were in a position of uh forever safety, all of a sudden they're like, oh boy, we're in we're in trouble. We got to start like trying to save some of our other assets around it. Which brings us to the the conversation of the day of 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 around a net worth statement. So in this scenario, this person's net worth a year ago looks significant. And now in the in the blink of an eye, outside of their control of of what happened in the market, their net worth is significantly different. Um, so to, to start our conversation, um, why don't you give us some of your thoughts on, on how you def define or described your clientele and your partners, the difference between a net worth statement, what is a net worth statement and a cash flow statement? Yeah. So a, a net worth statement is, it's not really any different than a, a balance sheet in a business, right? It tracks what you have versus what you owe. And if you subtract what you owe from what you have, you come up with the net value or your net, you know, your personal net worth. The, the cash flow statement is, is similar, but instead of tracking um, the value of assets or the value of what you still owe somebody, it's tracking, you know, what's coming in and what's going out. So um, income versus expenses. Um, if, uh, if a balance sheet is, is, uh, is kind of your, your truck, um, you know, the cash flow is somewhat the drivetrain, you know, yeah. if, if you will, that's that. Um, but the money ultimately has to go. The, the trick is to make the money go from the cash flow statement to the net worth statement somehow. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting as, as people start to, to grab this con uh, concept and the importance of both of them, kind of a comment I get uh, regularly is, um, aren't they the same thing, which they're, as you just described, they're completely different things and tell a different story of your, your wealth. Mm -hmm. The other comment I get that cracks me up is like, well, I'm too busy to do both of them. So which one should I do? And I'm like, you're, you're not seeing, <laughs> you're not, you're not seeing the pit, the picture. If you really care about, about taking ownership of your wealth and, and, and driving it forward, it's the the net the net worth statement. It, it shows you your overall uh, worth and how those assets are allocated. And the cash flow statement plays two pieces in that. Right? It's the the active income you're creating off of your your job and your energy, and and you're using that money to actually infuse or grow your asset class in your net worth statement. Mm -hmm. But over time. The, the passive income on that net worth statement, because there's active income and passive income, is what's going to feed you down the road off of your assets in your net worth statement when you decide and if you decide to retire. So the relationship between those and how you you mold them over time are, are going to determine how much you enjoy your, your retirement years. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I look back to being a small kid playing Robert Kiyosaki's board game cash flow. Yeah, yeah. And and uh if anyone's ever played that game, you know, they've run a balance sheet or a net worth statement and a, a cash flow statement. They just don't always realize it, right? But that's what the game forces you to do. And the reason I do love that game so much is because it it forces people to understand how they work together. So that's the first plug I'll give is if you haven't played that game, get a, get a copy somewhere and and play it. Yeah. Um because it teaches you how they integrate. Um, and, I, and I think to your point, what you're saying is you need to build the net worth statement strategically so that way the the um, assets on your balance sheet 
are providing opportunity for cash flow on the cash flow statement that's passive versus active. And then as that cash flow, that's income, right? Goes to your net cash flow. Now you have two opportunities, right? You, you can spend it, but you can also use it to build more assets that produce more passive cash flow, right? And so all of a sudden they, 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 they're separate statements, but they start flowing together in different ways. And that's how you, that's how you build wealth uh, instead of figuring out how to retire. I think those are two different, those are two different things. And I think one is a, a little bit more of a, I don't want to use the word scarcity mindset, but right. You're trying to figure out how you're going to make something last and how it's going to, you know, can I make my money last till, till, till the end? Um, and the other one is, Hey, I, 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 I'm continually growing and building. It doesn't matter how long I live. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. It's interesting. A lot of people think that um, the word rich and the word wealthy are synonymous, right? That they mean the same thing. And, and they're, what I would, what I would encourage our listeners to think through is, is uh, what wealth really is to me is that your, your net worth statement is built in such a way that those assets without you showing up to work are creating cash flow that shows up on your cash flow statement in excess of your living expenses. Where on the other, so that would be a wealthy person is my assets are set up in such a way that they're, they're creating and producing a consistent passive income in excess of my living expenses. The, uh, a rich person, someone that's perceived to be rich is one of two things. They either have built up a, a big asset class, but those assets are not producing income for them, meaning they're non-income producing assets like their primary residence, uh, that boat in the garage, the RV, all these things that they've worked so hard to create. Or, and then on the other side, they might have, they might feel like they have a ton of cash flow on their cash flow statement that's that they're using to buy those fun assets, but it's active income. If meaning if they don't show up to work tomorrow, that cash flow dries up the next day and, yeah. and it, it's not replaced by the income coming off their assets. So a lot of times in, in, in our world, people perceive that person to be rich. When if you really dig into it, they're they're one or two months away. From a catastrophe from a cash flow statement uh well yeah and cash cash flow catastrophes turn into net worth catastrophes right very very quickly right because that's <laughs> that's where you reach for your cash if I, your cash is gone either you or the bank will start reaching for for the assets on your your net worth statement well you know it's a, it's an interesting planning exercise that sometimes we go through with with clients um Sometimes it's it's clients that are a little bit uh, I don't want to say older, um, but you start getting into your you start getting into your fifties, um, and you have to have this pretty serious conversation around um, long term care, for example, right? It, most people are going to experience a long term care at some point in their life, long term care event, and uh, you know, like my grandparents were fortunate enough to fund seven years of long term care, twenty four seven in home help. I mean, that's not a cheap expense but they had the assets to do it. Right. Yeah. Um, not everyone has that. There's insurance policies you can get to put in place. There's different ways to plan around it. Right. But what's really interesting is to get out the net worth statement and say, okay, when the long-term care event happens, I, I, we want to understand in what priority are we going to utilize assets to fund that? Right. Are we yep. selling rental properties? Are we selling, you know, liquidating stock holdings? What, you know, what is it? Because if they're all, if there's all of a sudden legacy assets, right? Maybe you've developed a, a portfolio of apartment complexes and you really want to keep that in the family and pass it on to, to children so they have that passive income earlier in life than you did, then you want to make sure that that's not going to be what's funding your the liquidation of that is not what's going to be taking care of you at some point. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's a great point and a really good example. I mean, you you brought up that term, uh, a legacy asset. I think a lot of people are familiar with uh, what assets are. Tell us a little bit more about what a legacy asset is. I, to, you know, there, I, I, I'm at least not aware of a definitive definition around this, but the way that I would classify it is an asset that I want to stay in my family, right? So it's an asset that I want my kid to maintain and benefit from. I really don't care you know, if, if I have a, a, a Roth IRA of a mixed, you know, mutual funds or ETS, I couldn't care less if they sell that and take cash and yeah. go do whatever. But if I have, you know, again, I, like I just mentioned apartment complexes, Yep. 
if I had a holdings of, of apartment complexes, man, they're in great locations, great properties. They've been maintained super well. They're really a great, awesome long-term asset or a closely held business, right? The family business. Someday, I, you know, my dad uh, hopes to pass a, a, a legacy firm uh, opportunity to, to me, and I'd hope to pass that to my kids. It's a long-term, you know, closely held asset. Um, that's that's a legacy asset, right? And and then the one other thing that I'll include in that maybe is um, life insurance could be a, a legacy asset, not in the sense that it's your kids are obviously going to hang on to it, but that it's providing liquidity to keep legacy assets. So yeah. if you have a substantial net worth, you you might need the liquidity in your estate to to keep those assets and yeah. not have to sell them to pay some estate taxes. But also the the, the life insurance can insure that you do pass on a legacy, especially if you, um, you know, meet your demise uh, sooner rather, yeah. <laughs> sooner than you expect. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great point. I think that is the simplest form of a, a legacy asset is the the life insurance policy. And I agree with you. I think, I think and this is one of the areas what that and one of the things, first things I asked you uh, when we, you and I first started connecting was that idea of, you know, the, the way the majority of the world looks at, um, the end of their world is, do I have, am I going to make enough money to make it to my death day where a, 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 in that scenario, nothing lives behind beyond you. I love that idea of it's not about just building enough money to live on ramen in your last couple of days of life, but it's like, what are you building that will live beyond you that can change the, the trajectory of, of your, your, uh, ancestors, uh, lives or, or, or whatever charity you want to serve beyond that. So I, I love that idea of thinking through wealth on a bigger scale of how do I leave a legacy and some assets that continue to produce that income. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, a net worth statement first. Let's talk on that side of the scenario. So uh, just we're going to keep it pretty simple in, in, in asset yeah. classes and things like that for this conversation. But just just for a quick uh, reminder for people, what like what is the basic uh, math equation or structure of a, a net worth statement? So uh, assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Pretty simple, right? So let's let's talk about assets first. Uh, I know you and I were talking a, a little bit beforehand about it. There's different types of assets that live on that sheet. And sometimes there's questions on, well, does, is this an asset? Is that an asset? So let's, let's talk through some basic big buckets of what would be considered assets. Walk me through that conversation. Well, I think what you, you, have, to, you have to start with that, the big bucket of what's an asset, in my opinion, if you can sell it for any kind of significant value, it's an asset. Yep. Um, I know that can be controversial in some different circles, right? Of homes, you know, being assets or not, or liabilities. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at the generally accepted accounting principles, that would define that if you can sell it for value and it retains any kind of value, then it's an asset. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, there's two major buckets within that though that you have to break it out into. And that's that's in, in investment assets or personal use assets. Yep, love it. So the, the the terms I use on that are very similar. I use I use income producing assets or non-income producing assets. So mm -hmm. right, same scenario you're talking about is it is it an asset that produces income for me that I can I can count on to be a legacy asset or is it one that I an asset that I bought that I could sell if I needed to, but I really bought it for my personal use, right? Yeah. And so I think this is an interesting conversation to have with kids growing up because that's going to help with their decision making powers to be driving down the road and you know you point to uh, uh, the Tesla next to you and you say is that a uh, income producing asset or a non-income producing asset. And then you point to that diesel truck that's driving with you on, on the other side of you. That's like pulling a big old cargo. Is that an asset for that company? Or is that a, an income producing asset or a non-income producing asset? They're both on wheels moving down the freeway, but they have different purposes and they show up differently on someone's net worth statement. Well, and, and that's what makes you know, everything with wealth is always unique and you got to understand it's unique to your own situation because, you know, to take that conversation one step while there is, what if it's a Tesla, but it's part of a fleet of, you know, EVs that somebody owns as a company that they're rentals or some, you know, yeah. thing, right. Yeah. All of a sudden it's an asset, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Not the cash flowing asset or cash producing assets. So yeah. everyone's playing a different game and it's, you know, the, 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 
it's not the, the specific asset that determines whether it's an investment asset or a personal use asset. It's your own personal situation and use of that asset. That, you know, is it for your own personal enjoyment or is it to help you build a legacy, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great point. So a couple of quick uh, points I'd like to make to, to our group of entrepreneurs that listen to this is one is your, we're talking about a personal net worth statement. Your business assets uh, should be on your business balance sheet. And then on your personal net worth statement, maybe an ownership stake in that business. Um, the other the other comment that I would make on this that I get regularly in regards to a net worth statement is, um, will the market, like, for example, we've had this huge run up on the real estate market is, and I get an argument with some of my friends where they really maximize the value of those assets on the net worth <laughs> statement. And I tend to be very conservative in that, right? So if I knew, uh, uh, you know, this this rental property in, in the market a year ago, a year and a half ago, could have sold for five fifty, and now I could sell it for four seventy five. I I still have been running my my that the value of those type of assets so conservatively from a um, a valuation standpoint that even in a market coming down, I haven't had to shift it at all because I tend to be more conservative in that. Um, however, the liability is the liability. You put that exactly what it is in the moment. That's how you calculate true net worth. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, with that one in particular. There, there's a couple different ways to do it. I, uh, I, I think what, particularly with real estate, there's two, two effective ways to, to, to manage the value of that asset. The first one is to, you know, take what you think the fair market value is. And I, I, I will roll off seven to 8% off that value, um, figuring the cost of sale. Um, the, the other way to do it is to take what it produces as an income producing property. And if it's in your investment assets, right, that should be really easy to do because it's, produce, it should be producing some kind of income. Yep. Um, you, what, what is, what's the, the capitalization rate on your net income annually on that? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and what would the capitalization rate be for you to want to rebuy it today? Yeah. That's, that's the value. Like that's to me, that's the real value. That's what people are, you know, so if, if, you, if it's going to only sell, if it's going to sell at an eight cap now, cause rates are higher and things are coming down. You yep. want to be really honest with yourself about what your net worth is. You you might want to value it that way. It's it it can be brutal, especially in the current market conditions with rising yeah. rates. But it's it's it um it puts you in a place where you're a little bit uncomfortable and say, ooh, that's my net worth. You know, I, maybe I I was feeling like I was a millionaire, and maybe I'm really not the millionaire yeah. I thought I was. I got to keep I got to keep at this, right? Yeah. So yeah. So I, I I encourage everyone from an asset standpoint. Uh, be be very detailed on there of whether it's an income producing asset or a non-income producing asset. On your in, income producing assets, I would I would still say be fairly conservative on that. On your non-income producing assets, I'm I'm very conservative on that. Like even on on my my cars and and uh, toys, I really tend to to uh, undervalue them. I basically look at if I had to sell this today on a fire sale. What could I walk down the street and get it for? Yeah, and that's what I that's what I value my my uh, non income producing assets, except my my personal residence. As I run that a little bit higher, as if I had like thirty or sixty days to sell it, what could I sell yeah. it for? Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, that's that's what. We, unless there's something else you wanted to add with an asset class, there is I would just make sure from. I would put them in as income producing assets, non-income producing assets. If you have ownership in a business, which a lot of us do on this call, we have ownership in our businesses. I tend to run that um, uh, pretty conservative as well, particularly if my intent is not to sell that business, but to keep that business for cash flow. Because a lot of times I'll let those run on my, my net worth statement uh, for the cash that I'm into it. My, my cash investment into that property is a lot of times what I'll show on my net worth statement. Uh, until for some reason I had to value that company for something else. I got a true valuation of it and figured out my 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 portion of it. And then I'd figure out a conservative number on that is how I treat those assets on my, my, my personal net worth statement. Any other comment on assets before we talk about liabilities? Um, no, I, no. Okay, awesome. Li <laughs> liabilities. Tell us some of your thoughts on, on liabilities. Liabilities is something that has a debt. It's a debt. Right, Li liabilities is a debt section. Um, there's two two categories of of debt. Right, there's current, current, and non-current. So, 
Um, you could also think of that as like short term and not short term. So from an accounting standpoint, a current is usually something that's due within the next year. Yep. Um, you know, and non-current is something that's due further out than that. So like credit cards are always, and, and, and I'm going to lump signature loans in that, like any of that unsecured debt, um, line of credits, all that's current liabilities, right? Um, then you have non-currents is going to be your, um, you know, your, your mortgage, um, uh, your, uh, investment related debts. If you, if you have any, um, you could potentially do vehicle loans or recreational vehicle loans in there. Although I just like to encourage people to try to not have those. Um, yep. but if you do have them, that's where they go. Um, but when you are tracking liabilities, you, you might, uh, if you want to get really complicated with it, you could take what you're going to owe on that loan in the next 12 months and, and drop that as an, as a line item into current liabilities. Yep. Um, Love that. I think that's a really good uh, description of that. I, I a lot of times I talk about because some some people try to give the this idea of of all debt is bad debt, um, and I, I think debt is actually one of uh, debt is uh, is 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 similar to leverage, right? And you're leveraging something by using other yeah. people's money. If you use leverage appropriately, uh, you can build your net worth and get a higher return on on the right asset classes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you use debt inappropriately, it, it could be the thing that buries your net worth at a very fast pace. So it is either an accelerator, a very quick accelerator of building your worth, or it can actually be not even brakes on it, but a decelerator. Like it's going to push you backwards if it's used in, inappropriately. So as, as a lot of my listeners know, I talk a lot about money rules is one, one of my personal money rules that I just really encourage people to live by. And you already touched on it is, is to not carry consumer debt. And uh, don't I do, I refuse to take loans on non-income producing assets. The only one that I I feel okay with with some people is is on your primary residence. A lot of times to get into a primary residence, depending on where you are in your career, is a non-income producing asset. But but to get a loan on it because you can get a, a, you normally a more competitive interest rate on your personal home, which then gives you more assets to go build wealth. But from that that boat that razor. Uh, those type of things, like for me, it's there really is very little excuse to get a loan on on that type of product if if you're serious about building long term wealth. Well, well, I think the one thing that's that's um, allows for that one exception, right? The loan on the primary residence is um, if you buy a truck or a car or a boat or a razor or any of those things, and you 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 buy. I'm going to call it. I I heard this phrase. I think I believe it's a Gary Keller thing, right? Buying luxury on margin. Mm. Um, if you, if you take that loan, the razor will almost undoubtedly, okay, like let's get bar 2021 and 2022 out of there. Like yeah. zoom out a little bit. It's going to go down in value every year. Right. Whereas your, your primary residence does have, um, the ability to hopefully inflation adjust and increase in value. Obviously that's, there's no guarantee there, yeah, but, but the, a high likelihood, the high likelihood that the home is going to continue to, you know, increase in value incrementally over the years while the loan's decreasing, it's the, it, that's what makes it acceptable, right? That's, that's where you okay. can use, that can be healthy leverage on a primary residence. Although depending on where your risk tolerance is, you still might want to just get your primary mortgage paid off. Yep. Um, but and yeah. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, we're very much in alignment with that. So here's, this is where pe people love to add up their assets and think, look at all this stuff that I own. What they don't like to do is have a real conversation around their liabilities, right? To say like, yeah. what, what do I owe? Because that doesn't feel good. In these little, for a lot of people, these little $100 payments here and a $400 payment there and a $75 payment there, they feel inconsequential, but they're working against their ability to build long-term wealth. So uh, to kind of wrap up this, this part, of, part of the conversation, I would encourage you, number one, is make a list of all your debts on your net worth statement, highlight any of them that are, are considered consumer debt, and I would write out the APR next to them. And if you if you write out the APR and some of the credit cards and stuff you're carrying, you're going to feel sick to your stomach. And, and then I would, one of the first things I would focus on is how quickly can you get rid of that consumer debt? And you'll, you'll notice that having a huge impact on your net worth. Because we talked about assets, you add up your assets, you uh, add up your liabilities, you minus the liabilities after it. Hopefully what's left over is a positive number. And that would be your, your net worth. Um, anything else we should be talking about on a net worth statement? No, I think one of the things that you you kind of uh, 
taught me was to track that on a monthly basis. And I, 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 I like that concept. So I, I, uh, um, have started to implement that myself and, uh, what would, would encourage everyone to do the same track, track, a, a, a net worth statement and a monthly cash flow statement on a monthly basis, close out your month and, and, and look at your progress. Love that. That was a, that was a, um, one of the the first things my first mentor in real estate uh, asked me to do is actually a job requirement. I was an assistant to him, uh, Tom Calder, and part of my my job requirement with him was that I had to track my net worth every month. And he and I had a conversation around it. And as a twenty one year old kid, that was not a fun fun conversation to be having. However, it got me in the habit of it, and it made me get really purposeful in it because. Uh, it's all about what's the goal of the goal. It's not just about making money this year. It's about building a long-term legacy. And that shows up in how what your net worth statement looks like. Everything I want to do with my family and in my life takes some element of funds to do it. It can either be active funds or passive income funds that are paying for it. And I'm hoping as the farther I get down this, this path we call life is that it's my passive income paying for those experiences, not me eliminating experiences because I don't want to work anymore. Um, so I, I love that you've adopted that. And I encourage everybody the exact same thing is every month it should be uh, your net worth statement. And, and it, we put together goals around our income goals. There should be goals around how much do you want to affect your net worth in any given year? Yeah. Uh, cash, cash flow statement. What, what, do you want to, what do you want to talk through on a cash flow statement? Uh. So obviously you have your, your income and your expenses. Um, your income though, I, I just break it out. That's that, I think that's one of the biggest things people don't do is they, they say, okay, well, my income, I, I just add up all my income and that's, there's what it is. If you have no passive income, write zero under passive income. Right? <laughs> uh, if you don't have any business income, write zero. If you, you know what I mean? The only one that you are trying to get to zero is job income. Uh, and and you want to you want to see that draw down over the years, right? As you transition to um, business income, which hopefully becomes passive income, you know, by not managing the business, um, and true investment income, you know, that's considered passive, and potentially other income. Um, so you could get other income like from, from debt sources or, or different things. Um, but then you have expenses, right? Track what those expenses are, see where your stuff's going. Um, and what I found is the more that you, there could be a lot of expenses in people's monthly kind of statements, right? Like, I mean, if you oh. break it down to like, I'm paying, you know, for Netflix and, and iCloud and all these things, right? It gets to be a lot kind of, if you need to group them up to make it simple, Put what you're making for payments on 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 short term debt. Put what you're making for payments on long term debt. Um, you know, put put uh, what you're paying to run your household or, or or major expenses like that. Group them up. But what you can start seeing when you do that is, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much I was paying in in this category. Maybe I need to dive in deeper to that because I was expecting that that income and the, and the expenses to net out at, I should have $5,000 at the end of the month. Where the heck is that $5,000? Cause I don't usually have it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can go start trying to track it down. Or if you go, my gosh, there's $0 at the end of the month. And that's even what the statement's saying I should have. Well, I can't have that because I need to get money from this cash flow statement to, to flow back to the network statement. Right. I got to buy assets. Yeah. So I need money to go buy the assets. So, but now you have the categories where if one's standing out, like, oh my gosh, that is taking a lot of my income, you know where to start looking and focusing your efforts. I, well, well said. Um, I, and I think that's a, a piece that a lot of people miss is one of those expense line items should be investing mm -hmm. because it is an, an expense because you have to send that money out, but it does, it should stat, it go, it should go from your cash flow. It's not just money coming from your your assets feeding your cash flow statement. Some of that cash flow should be restacking back into new assets onto your yeah. net worth statement. So I, so like myself specifically, I have I have specific financial goals that that me and my wife have that we we have that as an expense, if you will, right? Um, and it's the simple stuff, right? Um, an, an example would be if somebody wanted to put like, hey, I want to make sure I fund my Roth IRA, right? Um, yep. Or 
or I'm trying to put money together for a down payment on an investment property. So I'm specifically funding a certain account with a certain amount each month. But then what I'm looking to do is still track all the money coming in. And even if after that there's, you know, 200, it doesn't matter if there's 200 or 2000 or $20,000, I, I want to know how much there is because I want to go buy assets with them. Right. Like I yep. want to, I still want to take that money and go buy more assets personally. Right. I don't want to say, oh, okay, well, I, I funded my asset, you know, uh, a, a liability, if you will, or, you know, expense. Yeah. Um, so now this is, you know, money to, to do whatever I want with. I um, use it, use it to intentionally fund goals. And if you don't have a specific goal, like go, just, just go buy some assets, right? <laughs> like, that's right. Just go buy some assets. Yeah, that's right. It, it's, it's interesting. And the other, the other comment I get from people that they tend, Somehow people have this delusion of let's let's say they make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and they think oh if I make I'm I, I all my expenses are covered I'm living a good life whatever whatever and somehow they think in their mind that when they turn sixty at some point they're gonna be like I'm gonna retire but somehow magically I'm gonna continue to make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars passively because they get they get frustrated that their passive income starts at a thousand bucks. Uh, a year, right? Or on and very small interest or whatever it is, but don't get discouraged on that. That's a, that's a seed. You've started something special there and you'll see that compound interest is, is a real thing. If every dollar you're making, if a portion of that is going to build the assets, the right assets on your, on your uh, net worth statement, you will see that passive income grow at a very fast pace. And that, that takes time. It takes effort. This is why most people don't retire at the age they want to retire. And most people don't retire with the, the uh, passive income or the net worth they want is because it, it takes time. It takes a process. You have to start and you have to, you have to nurture it. You have to uh, take care of it and plan it and make these decisions to do it. But that's where it starts to show up. It's not this magic solution to do it. It's, it's learning the skill set and, and taking it seriously. Nobody should care about your money more than you do. And this is how you do it is looking at your net worth statement and your cash flow statement on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, um, you know, I never want to plug any specific investment, right? This isn't, this is specific advice to anyone, but it's an observation I've had. And, and that's that. Um, and, and what sparked my mind, what, what sparked this in my mind is where you're saying, Hey, you know, Oh, somebody might only make a thousand dollars a year on, on passive cash flow on an investment or something. And they're frustrated. They feel like it's not worth it. Yep. Um, but I, I have yet to sit down with um, a client or prospective client that owns uh, at least one free and clear rental property that is not going to have the ability to retire. Hmm. I, I, I just, I, I haven't found that yet. Right. So yeah. um, there's a lot to be said about real estate and different ways to do it or handle it, but it's just an interesting observation that if somebody's had at least one rental property free and clear, and that's not a lot of net worth, right? No, like you, no, in yeah. many cases, you're talking three, four hundred thousand dollars, not a lot. But um, what that started with, whenever you see that, typically that somebody owns a property free and clear, is thirty years ago they bought the house and they've just stayed with it, right? Stayed consistent, and and boom, now they're looking to retire and they have this property that's unencumbered. Um, and, you know, I, I, sometimes I wish I like, I wish I would have sat down with them five years ago so that we could have leveraged it the right way and kind of, you know, built some more wealth for them. But, you know, they're at least in a place where they, 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 they have um, some passive income and, and, and it's a lot different conversation than, well, if we try to keep some risk on in your 401k and, you know, only take this much out per year, but it's going to get taxed in this kind of unfavorable way. And, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully you don't last till you're 95 because we're really going to be absent some issues if you do. Yeah. I, you know, that's, that's a way different conversation to have with people than, than, Hey, I have, um, I have my 401k or, you know, my IRAs, but it's providing the liquidity to have flexibility with different things that I want to do because they're more liquid assets yep. and, and not, not, I don't, I don't, I don't go tap those liquidity accounts, um, for, you know, uh, cash flow. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a lot different. It's it's so it's such a different conversation. Uh, I think that gives a pretty good summary of of both the the net worth statement and the cash flow statement. Uh, you know, sometimes people look at the cash flow statement as a, almost like a budget, uh, and it's it's a little bit deeper than that. But it's it's what what that tool you would use to track your income broken down into type of income minus expenses. 
Um, but ho- hopefully our, our, our listenership uh, found some value in that conversation. What I would encourage everyone to do to, to, as we wrap up our conversation today is if you haven't uh, taken the time recently to sit down and put together your net worth statement um, and your cash flow statement, number one is just commit to do it. I promise you the first time it feels clunky. It takes a little bit of time and energy, but if you do it, a couple of times, it really doesn't take that much time every month. It's just like you kind of go through the motion. You know how to do it. The first couple of times, you have to think through it a little bit, a little bit more. If you're already in the habit of putting together your net worth statement and your cash flow statement, and it's a habit for you, I would encourage you because of the the economic landscape we're in now, is this this month when you put it together, uh, give it a little bit of extra time and energy to sit on it and not just put it together to put it together off of a habit. But actually look at it and say, does this does this net worth and cash flow statement serve future me? Is this is this the tool? Like if I looked back retrospectively to the to, to me at 43, which that's how old I am now, would would I think that's the right mix of my asset classes and the cash flow it's producing that's going to serve the, the future version of me? Because as we're coming into a market, even to myself, one of the things I'm looking at is is the I'm shifting some of my asset classes based on the market we're coming into. One of my big one of the things I'm, I'm most concerned about is the value of the dollar moving forward and there's some uncertainty there. However, the value of a, a hard asset that people will need like a residential home um, regardless of what the, the value of the dollar does, there's going to be a demand for that product. Right. So I'm, I'm re looking at my asset classes. And so every once in a while, we, we put together a game plan, you execute it, but then you have to sometimes sit on that and say, is this still the game plan based, based on what I know now? Yeah. That's what I always tell people if they're working with a financial planner and the financial planner gives them a plan, they've done them a disservice because it's not, it's not a packet. It's a living, it's a living thing. You know, it's, I, I would be terrified if, if I, you know, flew in a plane and the pilot was like, well, I set course, I'm going to hop off here and this thing should fly itself to the destination, you know, like, right. They need to sit in that seat still and and help make those small corrections as, as, uh, the variables change a little bit. Right. So, um, and I think that's what tracking, tracking net worth and cash flow on a monthly basis helps you do is, is have that awareness and make the course corrections when, when they can remain small instead of having to make drastic changes later on. Yep. Love it. All right, Inshallah Nation, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, Brandon, uh, if uh, some of the videos you've been turning out lately, by the way, are awesome. Just great little nuggets of information. Where, where do people find you uh, if they want to connect with you and follow some of the stuff you're doing? Uh, primarily on Facebook or Instagram. My business page is um, just called Ducharme Financial. Um, uh, but uh, people are also always welcome to, to add me on. I, I'm primarily on Facebook. Um, How do you spell Ducharme so they can find you? Yeah. How do they spell Ducharme so they can find you? Well, they got to get Brandon right for something. Oh. <laughs> B-R-A-N-D-E-N, but Ducharme is D-U-C-H-A-R-M-E. Perfect. Awesome, buddy. Appreciate you. Appreciate your knowledge and uh, chatting through this stuff with me. Look forward to connecting more on it and uh, we'll talk soon.